also to Steve from Ticketmaster. Thanks. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, I thought it was a great talk earlier on, actually, and there's a lot of parallels, I think, between some of the stuff I'm going to talk about and actually where our businesses are as well. Uh, but I'm going to give you a slightly different view of our journey from the Ticketmaster side of the world. I've been with Ticketmaster for about 13 years. Um, actually, I came from a company that was called Clear Channel that spun out Live Nation, the entertainment part, which about six years ago merged with Ticketmaster to become Live Nation Entertainment. Live Nation Entertainment is a global company, uh, American company on the NASDAQ. Currently, I think we're in about just over 40 countries, uh, Live Nation and Ticketmaster. There's overlaps between some of them, but Live Nation will be in some countries where Ticketmaster's not and vice versa. Uh, very much a growing company. Uh, Live Nation, for example, uh, we added, I think, six markets this year, and next year we're going to add another 10 markets. So, very much a growing company. Um, Ticketmaster, currently about half of those countries, uh, again growing, I think we just went into another couple of countries this year, so already this slide is out of date, um, very much with trying to be agile, they are often going fast, companies going fast, I like to keep the slides up to date, um, and about half of those countries Ticketmaster, and we're actually the number one leader uh, for selling tickets, so you probably know Ticketmaster very much, we sell tickets to live events. Um, but we don't actually own the tickets. We are just, uh, uh, I guess, a retailer for the tickets. Live Nation, the other part of the business, they're the ones who work with the artists, they're the ones who promote the events, put the events on, they own the tickets. They're our biggest partner, our biggest client, uh, but we also sell tickets for lots of other clients. Uh, and in some countries where Live Nation doesn't exist, we sell them for other people, for example. Uh, so essentially what that means is Ticketmaster is a software and service company. We use our infrastructure, our scale, um, our capabilities for our clients to be able to sell tickets on their behalf. Um, from an engineering technology perspective, sorry about the, uh, the slides, um, we're, in, we're, we're, we're a team of about 200 plus um, engineers, systems engineers, uh, support staff, uh, etc. Uh, we're based internationally across five different locations. So we're headquartered here in London, uh, at Angel. Uh, but we also have uh, offices out in Quebec, Canada, uh, Serbia. Uh, we have sports teams up in Stoke and uh, up in Gothenburg in Sweden as well. For us, that's quite a challenge. So about two years ago, maybe a little bit more, we started our DevOps journey. Uh, and, and prior to that, we have been kind of agile with Agile, Scrum, but Waterfall, whatever you want to call it, but we're in that world. Um, so not only do we have silos locally, we had silos globally as well. Uh, lots of these teams weren't speaking to each other. Um, so part of our DevOps strategy was really trying to bring us all together, bring us closer together, uh, get us all to speak the same common language. We all speak English, but we all understand some things in different ways. So if you think about what's a I guess a successful um, delivery to production versus an unsuccessful. One team might have one opinion of what that might be, another team might have another opinion depending on their context and depending on what goes on with them. Um, what continuous integration should or shouldn't be, continuous delivery, what that should or shouldn't be. So we all understand the same things, but we're all talking slightly differently. So we want to bring uh, us all together, but also speak the same language. Um, we want to obviously break down those silos <coughs> being distributed. Uh, how do we break down those silos? Uh, and also at the same time, we want to increase the quality of what we deliver into production, uh, the reliability and stability of our applications and services, actually giving a better quality service back to the business. So those were some of the main objectives. Um, and what we started off with was, I guess, four main goals. We wanted to deliver value fast. We wanted to do it efficiently, but with quality as well. We want to do it reliably, but not just our applications, we want our environments to be reliable as well. And we want to deliver a high level of service. So those are our four goals. And what we started to do was trying to break those down into, I guess, tasks and requirements and things that we think they should be. We ended up with a great big mountain of these things. And it became very difficult trying to not just prioritize within each goal, but then trying to prioritize each of those requirements across different goals and then also across different teams. 
Um, so first part of the story is really about how we managed to, I guess, prioritise work and get teams rolling on delivering on some of these, these goals and requirements. What we managed to do is coalesce uh, a lot of the requirements for each goal down into these, I guess you can call them maturity, but also capability matrix. Uh, capability is probably a bit more correct. Uh, as you go from left to right, it's your capability is getting stronger, more, um, uh, you're getting more able to do something. So if I was to think about uh, databases, you might start off with ad hoc writing SQL scripts. Then you might have your SQL scripts actually in source control, and then you might start to use a tool. And then you might start to use that tool not just for the schema but for the data, and then it's automated out to production. So as you read from left to right, that capability is getting stronger and stronger and stronger to a, a far more automated sense, a far more reliable automated sense. Um, and the other nice thing about these is uh, they're modular. So if something changes, technology changes, so at the moment you've got Jenkins or Team City, but maybe something else will come in the future. Containers, Docker, maybe something will change in that in the future. We can pull out one of these sections and we can replace it with something else as the world evolves around us because in this DevOps world everything is getting much, much faster and changing rapidly. Um, we've got lots of different horizontals uh, and verticals. Uh, as you read down, so in this particular case, continuous deployment, we're talking about deployment, we're talking about environment, we're talking about design, architecture, etc. Uh, similar across the other ones. You know, health checks, monitoring alerts. Um, if you want to read more about these and have a look at them in detail, uh, please go to our blog. It's up there. Um, there's a nice little story, uh, and it's the story of this first part. <coughs> the other nice thing about these kind of matrices is actually we can kind of set targets as well for our teams. So not only does we have a goal, and we can set a view, it's quite a pragmatic view at the end of the day, but we can set a kind of view, a vision of where we think we need to get to. We can also set targets for teams. So, in terms of that database example, well, maybe we just want you to get to having your database schema managed within a tool. We don't need to automate today. We'll look at that in another year's time when we've got through everything else we want to do. There's a lot of stuff here. Yeah. Uh, so, we can start to set targets for teams. The other nice thing about these kind of matrices, these capability matrices, is they kind of act more like true roadmaps. So by having a target, a vision of where you want to get to in a target, teams can go off and get there on their own. So if I said to you, can you get to Birmingham from London, but one person lives on the east side, one person lives on the west side, you're going to get there by different routes, but you all know where you've got to get to. And it's the same thing with these capability matrices when we set targets. The teams know where they need to get to. They make the decisions on how they're going to get there. The business context around them might be different from one team to another. The technology we're working on can be different. Uh, so it's very hard for us to dictate what the priority should be for them to do something. Let them decide what's going to create the most value. Pick from that smorgasbord of opportunity, those capabilities, and create value. But at the same time, you're all progressing towards the same target point. So that's quite nice. It makes it very flexible for the teams. They can make the decisions themselves. It gives them a level of autonomy and independent decision making. So having those in place, the next bit that we did actually was we started to look at a few little pieces around standardization. We didn't want to go too far, but there were some things that we needed to do. Um, if we looked at our source controls, we had about five or six different source control build systems, etc. We're basically using multiple resources to solve the same problem. So standardizing on some things helps us basically to solve problems once. Um, and what we did is from each of the locations, we took one or two people, all together, create a little focus group, discuss what's the right tool to use, what's the right process, what's you know, essentially how we're going to standardize on some of these things. We all agree together, and that's what we went forward with. And that was our basic set of tooling uh, that we started with there. Um, we looked at some of our best practices, guidelines, definition of terms again we talked about. You know, we had different definitions, different understandings for, for the same thing, so we're all speaking the same language as well. We're now starting to solve problems once start to share that knowledge, start to share that understanding. Um, so we're starting to already go a little bit faster just by doing those pieces. <coughs> so off teams went, which is great, and we didn't have a clue where they were and what they were doing, but 
we felt we needed to do something. So we created our own little tool to visualize where they were. Uh, and it's basically, you know, ask them, have you done this? Where are you on the capability matrix? And, and basically score them into a simple tool. So we can have a look at where we are in the overall program, the overall uh, delivery, getting to a certain goal. Um, the rate at which teams are going, again, is really particular to each team. There's no one team going faster than the other at the end of the day. You could have a team of 20 developers versus a team of two on a different project and product. Um, the team of two may be going faster because they're on a green field rather than a team of 20 who is on a legacy system. So speed is not really the issue here. It's more about having visibility of the overall program and where we're getting to. And also where we can see, ah, oh, right, well, you're up here and you're doing this capability. Maybe you should start sharing that information with these teams over here who haven't got there yet. So now we know where people have got to and we can get them to start sharing knowledge across the other teams. So all the learnings and the problems they solve, they can share across to the other teams. So it's very much about sharing and, and, and nurturing that information across the business. So we're not failing multiple times, we fail once. And we're trying to learn some problems and then we, everybody gains from that information. So that's great, we've got an overview of the program, where people are, people are moving, we've got some flexibility in the system. Um, but at the end of the day, what's it all mean? It doesn't really mean much unless we're really creating value for the business. And so, oh, it again. Um, so we need to close that gap with the business and actually do some kind of reporting back to them. Um, and we started off with some very simple reporting. What's the stuff that we can measure? What's the stuff that we can get data for and report back to the business? We started off with some very simple things, you know, business disruption or functional disruptions, depends on what part of the system it might be. Critical bugs, what's coming out of development in the hit and production, how much rework we're doing. Uh, manual regression in some instances, depends on what team and how old the project is, how much manual regression is happening. And just tracking that over time and trying to find you know, uh, where the improvements are. So we can actually show that the program is working. Um, Trying to convert that back really into, I guess, business speak. So if we're doing rework critical bugs in production, I know, say, let's say it's five hours to fix a bug overall by the time you've done the, found it, done the research, you fixed it, and got it out to production. Now I know we're doing X amount of those over a year, similar with business disruptions and manual uh, regression. I can start to turn that back into man hours of effort. And I can now start to say how much man hours we're actually saving and improving a year and turn that back to the business and say, well, now we're saving this time, we're actually able to do more features and more, uh, more work. So we're now starting to talk to the business back on a common level that they understand. They understand dollars and man hours, uh, full-time equivalents, uh, and engineers understand the detail. So that helps us to close the gap there. By the end of this talk, I'll <laughs> It's okay. Um, so, just from that first part, what did we learn? Um, standardizing on our tooling was starting to change the way we did things. Okay. Um, and as we start to change the way we did things, we start to, I guess, believe in what we're doing. Um, the good reporting that we did changes how we communicate back to the business. Um, and that good communication to the business, they also believe in what we're doing as well. Okay, and at the end of the day then, it's starting to help us change our culture, both inside engineering and technology, but also outside with the executives in the business as well. And that's really important. It's not just about engineering, it's about the business being on the journey with you as well. <coughs> all sounds very nice, but I think as we all know, change is really hard. DevOps is really hard. DevOps is not really just about automating stuff. It's really about business transformation as well. There's cultural pieces in there. There's organizational pieces in there. There's technology challenges in there. It's really hard. And the next bit is really some of the things that we've kind of seen uh, as we've gone along on this journey. Um, part of it is stay focused. Um, it's a long journey. If you've done Agile and you move into DevOps, has anybody not moved to DevOps yet? No, everybody's on the DevOps journey. Oh, a couple of people. Okay. 
So for you guys, it's like that. All right. If you've done a bit of agile, that's easy. DevOps is really hard. Uh, prepare for it. Um, understand your processes. Understand the constraints. Conway's law. Um, think about continuous improvement. Retrospectives are really good for that piece. Think about the seven ways of software development. Automate as much as possible where you can. Focus on small goals, which really fits in with that. So, if your code coverage, for example, was I don't know, say, 10% on something, if it's an old system. Don't think about turning that to 80%, which is what your organizational target might be for everything. Think about 10.5%. Small goals, incremental, build on that constantly. Uh, and get your teams to think about that as well. Baking in small little wins. Uh, every time you win, every time you learn something, share it. So everybody else learns and wins as well at the same time. And celebrate these wins, because these are great things, right, at the end of the day. Um, we're always focused on the delivery and the value. At the end of the day, it's value. We're all here. We're not here to write code. We're not here to deliver a feature. We're here to deliver business impacts. We're here to deliver value at the end of the day. So be focused on putting on this bit. But really prepare for that journey at the end. Um, <coughs> measures of success. I mean, at the end of the day, this is one of the ways in which you can communicate and also whether you, from an engineering point of view, a technology point of view, whether actually you're succeeding or not. Um, so, what we did was start really on the data we could collect quite easily. We packaged that up into PowerPoint, PDF reports, send that out by email. And as most of you probably know, nobody ever reads email. So, it had great value to start with, but the lifespan of that kind of reporting is very limited. Um, so you very rapidly want to move on to that. Automate and make it and turn it into dashboards. Okay. Get it visible, get it in front of everybody, get it in their faces. Get it in the faces of your execs, get it in the faces of your developers and engineering teams. Um, once you start to do some of this, you're going to want to start standardizing on your, your processes and terminology because you want to be measuring apples and apples, not apples and oranges. So if people record bugs in one particular way and they record bugs in a different way over in this system, how do you know you're measuring the same thing? So you've got to start uh, standardizing on some of those things. And eventually, you know, run out of things that you can do easily. So now you've got to start thinking about things that you don't have and start working out how you're going to measure them as well. Um, so this is what we did, was measure on the savings to start with, but now we're moving into measuring the speed, measuring value, and showing that business impact in that business. Um, um, and the other thing is, we've started to measure this as well, is um, talked about it in the last talk, was really about the accountability piece as well. And at the end of the day, you're accountable for doing this. So without having the right data, without being able to show that data, without being able to report and dashboard it, you don't know if you're really producing that. So you need to have the data available to be able to be accountable. Uh, Platform maturity, so Ticketmaster is a 40 year old country um, and some of our technology is 40 years old as well. That doesn't mean to say you can't do DevOps with 40 year old technology, you can. Um, but at some point it becomes quite restrictive uh, and you want to mature your platforms. Um, and some of those things that you need to do is look at technical debt. Even with Greenfield projects, Greenfield projects will go uh, and gain technical debt very quickly every time you add the line of code, essentially you're adding technical debt to the system. Uh, so you want to be measuring and looking at your technical debt and paying it back in some form. Um, deployment, uh, trying to deploy a monolith, you can do it, it's painful. So you want to be architecting for your deployment as well. Um, so uh, that really fits in with your technical debt as well. I'll show you the model uh, that we use in a sec. Uh, so look at your architecture, look at your, your system, and how you're trying to support that. <coughs> And that really fits down to the next bit is really about the design, trying to make it modular, sharing services. So one team over here, so one of our teams may be in Quebec, this is one of our teams in London. And why are they writing the same service twice? Let's just write it once and okay, we get more efficiency at that point. Uh, testing, as you want to go faster, testing becomes critical for all this. So continuous testing, not just right at the beginning where you do the unit testing functional integration testing, etc. 
performance testing, all the way out to production, installation testing. Uh, but even when you're in production, continuously testing there as well. Some of those tests that you may be using for integration testing, you may be able to continuously run them on your production system as well. And have constant monitoring, constant, constant dashboards. Um, and again, also if you're trying to go faster, instrument new code bases. You need to instrument the hell out of them as much as you can at the end of the day. Um, if something goes wrong, and we know things will go wrong, I can't help that, even as good as your continuous testing might be. Uh, make sure that you've got your code bases instrumented so you can get to root cause analysis as fast as possible. You can solve the problem, you can get it out of production if you've got the automated deployment in place. So actually your mean time to detect, your mean time to repair is massively shrinked. So the impact of the business, very, very small because you've isolated the problem very quickly and you manage to repair it very quickly as well. Um, so, yeah, platform maturity, think about efficient delivery uh, and support around that because really, once you start getting into testing the code base, that really helps with the support aspect. Our technical debt model uh, that we kind of use, again, you go to our blog and have a look for uh, a good, good piece on that there. You got the standard kind of application debt. Actually, we extended it, what the concept of technical debt was for us. We start to think about infrastructure debt. You know, how many times do you have a a system that needs patching and updating and hasn't got done. <laughs> so yeah, so think about your infrastructure, think about what depth might exist out there as well. But also the architecture debt. So I want to talk about re-architecting for deployment, etc. Thinking about the future, what's your transition state, where do you want to get that system into the future? So think about those three things. And finally, it's not all about technology. It's very much about the organization as well. You start off thinking it's about technology, but very rapidly you start thinking about teams, organization. Is it one pizza team or two pizza teams, etc.? Is it cross-functional? Is it not cross-functional? Is it co-located? Is it not co-located? Uh, communication is really the key piece about co-location uh, and for me I think co-locating as much as possible but depending on your organisation that might not be possible that might take time to rearrange the chess pieces as it were uh, to be able to get to that point um, but ultimately you want a team that's going to be planned together cross-functional team that's going to be planned together engineers are very good at thinking about the code the systems people are very good at thinking about stability and sustainability bring them together you've got two halves of the same coin Using systems thinking to start thinking about the problem and actually making long term sustainable uh, solutions. Um, shared projects, now at the end of the day, DevOps is Dev and Ops. There's no point having Dev doing something and Ops doing something, that's not DevOps, even if they can hand over to each other later on. Um, get them working on the same projects, that's DevOps. Okay? That brings the culture piece together, that brings trust as well. So, co locating the teams, getting the cross functional. Brings the trust together once they start working on the same projects. If they're not working on the same projects, the trust thing is hard to build. <coughs> um, think about shifting left in some of the problems that you have. Um, simple things, maybe perhaps one of resets or something like that. Shift it up to the lead, uh, sorry, to the support teams who are closer to uh, taking in that request. Okay? Um, that will massively reduce your lead time. Um, same with code repeating actually as well, uh, massively reduces your lead time. Um, and also it can reduce your costs as well. Uh, platform teams, so it's great, we've got these cross-functional delivery teams, they're working on features and products and they're getting them out the door. Um, but you might want to think about maybe a platforming team as well, which is underpinning everybody. So they're creating the runways that platform team, the, the product teams can actually uh, deliver off. Um, and at the end of the day, with these kind of teams, you want to make them uh, so that they've got autonomy, authority, and accountability. So the accountability is really thinking about the metrics, KPIs, the values. Are we delivering that? Making them account back to some kind of governance team, um, whether that's a CTO or whether that is a product uh, director or whatever it is, but they need to report back. But given the vision, given um, the ideas of where they need to get to, 
and then allow them to get there on their own. Let them solve the problem, don't tell them what the problems are. And then the last bit that I really like, is, some people in the team don't, is build it, ship it, and you also support it. So why should I hand what I've built over to someone else to ship it or support it? I know how it works. They don't know how it works. They don't have to pay with you for it. So I am the best person to support it at the end of the day. So I kind of really advocate that piece of it. Um, that's about it. So yeah. <laughs> to it, uh, other than you've got to negotiate, and typically engineering, we're not as good at negotiating as product people are, right? Um, and so part of this, the organization is really about setting up an environment where they can negotiate that autonomy piece, um, but that takes effort to get there, so it's a business transformation as well. Um, Agile and Scrum don't solve this problem. Um, so there's more that has to be done around that to solve it, but I can pretty much guarantee you most businesses, yes, we do have it. Yeah. But just like in this space, I've never seen this. I've worked in other areas, this is <laughs> worse, to be honest. I was just thinking, you know, you know, do you think DevOps, I mean, I'm not sure where you are at in terms of cultural transformations, but, you know, do you think it actually helps to deal with this kind of situation? No, I think, no, uh, I, 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 I think the, 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 move, the going on the DevOps journey yeah. has helped us to see that there's more than just the automation that needs to come in. There's a lot more. Um, there are other companies actually where you might think it's solved. I mean, if you go to Facebook and the way they work, it's just bonkers. It's autonomy heaven uh, in yeah. many ways, right? Um, but yeah, it's not just the engineering team who have to go on this journey. You've now got external teams, whether it's your PMO, who normally want to keep things nice and rigid and process driven, um, and actually they need to not be like that, they need to be a bit more flexible and let you evolve, uh, but also at the same time manage risk and resource and cost, etc. Uh, and the product team need to be a bit more understanding about the engineering aspect and, and create that balance, and we need to communicate better, so hence trying to have dashboards, reporting, impact, etc. Um, so there's a lot of things to get in place to get out of this hole. Um, I'm not saying we've solved it, definitely not, but right, it's right. something that we, we are actively looking at and want to try and achieve here. Yeah, uh, I was wondering how you recognise touts. How do I recognise? Touts. Yeah, 
Tout. Tout. You mean people who sell tickets on the tickets on the street? Um, you just walk down the street, you can see. Them, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. It's a different question. It's not really for this one. Okay. So ask me after. All right. Hi, man. Um, you had a slide on measuring for success. I think that's quite important. Yeah. I just wondered if you could expand a little bit on uh, if you use any third-party tools for the automation of those measurements. And if you did or didn't, how did you then ensure that you actually use those results to further kind of push what you were doing? So let me start with the last part first. Um, <coughs> To start with, we're just collecting data manually from JIRA or whatever tools that we're using. Report on it, but each of the delivery teams, the managers or whoever the lead is for that team, would have to make an account of this was the problem, or these are the things that we're doing over the next couple of months, and uh, this is what we expect to improve, and this is why we're doing it. And they would have to do that monthly. Um, and that would then come up to engineering leads and our SVP at the time. Um, we're now trying to change that a little bit, but it won't be too dissimilar to that in the future, I don't think. Um, so that's how you make people accountable. You have to get them to understand why they're doing some of this stuff. Um, in terms of the tooling, uh, we started off with, I guess, some basic tooling. So Jira VM1, uh, depends what kind of metrics you want to get. If you want to get system metrics, with Using open TSDB time series databases, um, it might be Zabbix um, for uh, monitoring and alerting, so then we can take a look at those afterwards. Uh, we have our change tool, our own internal custom change tool we built, so something <coughs> happens, any change that we production, etc. We've got that monitoring. So we've got lots of different tools, and it's just managing to put connectors to them. If it's a web project, um, I mean, we've gone through different. Um, different third parties over the years, currently for monitoring some of our external web uh, sites, use things like Rigger, um, but there are other tools as well. Uh, as long as they've got an API, and that's what we're looking at more and more now, is APIs and pulling those data into central locations to dashboard them. Um, you might want to start off just doing a live pull of data, but you're going to have quite a bit of latency display, and then once you start to get the right data you want, then start to work out how to make more performance, so maybe pulling that on an hourly or whatever it is, or using webhooks to pull back to you, storing that data, <coughs> managing that data into a format that you can pull back on quite easily. Yeah. Just have one, one more question. Um, technology is changing very fast, um, as we're all aware. Mm. You're a 40-year-old business. Um, and how do you view competition that's coming up? Do you see it's great pressure on you engineering? <coughs> I'm not asking commercially. See that um, I mean, uh, you, you look at any business, any grown up business, uh, technology could wipe them all out at any moment in time. Um, you've got to, I think you've got to look at yourself as a dinosaur and how you're going to reinvent yourself, right? Um, because if you don't, someone else will. Um, so this is really important really to help get to the next piece, uh, which actually we've already started in many ways, is really about innovation okay, and keeping yourself up to date and moving forward uh, at pace. So starting to move into things like hypothesis driven development, etc. Always looking for that business impact, trying to improve on that business impact effectively. But ultimately what you want to get is that one gem as well that's really going to fire you off to the next level. Uh, and you become a monopoly in that little area until other people can start to invade that space. So, you know, people are in our space. We're not number one in most countries or in most of markets. In the UK, we're certainly not. Uh, well, we're one of the biggest, but there is plenty of competition in the UK for us. So, we're certainly, you've got to be constantly aware of that. Do you feel you're agile enough to adopt? Are you, your teams agile enough to adopt to it? Or do you feel there's a tremendous amount of pressure? No, I'm not feeling a huge amount of pressure. Um, I think the teams are at a level of maturity. They, there is definitely a long way they can go. But I think they are, you know, we've got some great teams at the moment. They are doing really good stuff. Um, certainly in the last year, I mean, some of the results that we're starting to see, um, we're showing that as well. So 
it's, it's, again, it's, a, it's, it's a big, big journey, this. And I think it's not just engineering that has to come on this journey, it's around the business as well. Um, you know, classic story is we're going so fast now. Uh, this is from one of our, uh, our salespeople. We're going so much faster now, they're learning how to, how to, how to sell better. So we've got that much faster that actually it's pushing out to the extremity parts of the business that they're having to improve themselves as well. So that just says that we're doing the right things. Um, but I know that we can do a lot more as well. It's interesting because you're a great brain, but you're agile as well. Thank you. Any last questions? Any other questions? How, does I, how, does, how do the agile practices fit into the uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, I mean, kind of hand in glove in a sense. I mean, DevOps is kind of agile. Uh, the technology piece is really just stuff to put on the backlog. So you need to have that negotiation, put it on the backlog. It's all about prioritization. You know, am I going to automate uh, testing? Am I going to put instrumentation in? Am I going to do some deployment piece or whatever, whatever it might be, it's just stuff to do. It just needs to get prioritized and put on the backlog. Um, so it very much fits with our job. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be competitive. And if anything, actually, what you'll find and what we're trying to hold, so I am and what some others are is trying to push for, is actually moving from Scrum to Lean. So trying to shrink your lead and your cycle times uh, by going faster, having multiple deployments to production as fast as possible. And then you're, you're switching the type of agile that you're doing, so your agile will change over time. Just a quick one, uh, yep. just around. Um, so how, when you're bringing in a lot of this non-functional stuff <coughs> around, we've got instrumentation into this, we've got to automate this, we've got to make this go faster. Um, how do you sell that um, additional expense, which is what it is, into uh, a team that's into your, say, your product teams, your commercial teams, who are saying? We just need a thing, and we need it now. There's a there's there's a there's a, there's a conversation to be had there about well, we can give we, we could give it to you, but it will be taking <coughs> over in 20 minutes. So so I think that's the conversation, right? I mean, you have to make them understand. Uh, look at past experience. Look at your you know at the end of the day, you're a professional. You should be respected as well. So uh, it's very hard. We do have those questions. We do have those problems. Um, sometimes it's about having standards as well. Just saying this is the basic standard that we do, and we won't go beyond that. Have that agreement up front with the product team, and all agree that. And then it's a negotiation when you're delivering. Okay, we'll deliver this a little bit faster at lower quality, but we're going to take the next sprint and put that quality back in. But it's going to cost you. If we do it now, we'll do it for X amount. But now we're doing it later because we've already put stuff in. It's going to cost more to do that. We're going to add X plus 20%. So you have to have those conversations probably up front yeah. and agree it, and then you can find that balance and negotiate a bit later. I wouldn't say we're perfect at it, but yeah, that's kind of how you want to try it. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.